This is John Colo with OKRaw.com to do another exciting episode for you guys. In this episode, we're going to be answering your guys' questions. Sorry, I have over a million followers on all my different social media outlets, so I can't answer any questions or any comments under the videos directly, although sometimes I take a peek and will respond to new videos. But most of the time, please, guys, don't expect an answer from me. I'm so busy doing everything in my life just trying to put out content on my three YouTube channels. Anyways, in case you guys have a question for me, I do have a way you may be able to get it answered. If you post it in the link down below to my community tab, I will take questions from there and pull it and uh, put it into a Q&A like this the following month. So in any case, let's get on to this month's question. The first question is from uh, Chaz Law in 5061. What brands of frozen fruits and vegetables would you recommend? All right, Chaz Lawn. So here's the thing, like I basically don't buy a whole lot of fr frozen fruits and vegetables. Generally when I do, I just go to Costco or Trader Joe's because they're the least expensive um, places to buy them. And generally I trust the Kirkland brand, which is normally what I get. I usually get uh, more regularly like the frozen organic peas and frozen organic corn. Sometimes they have the frozen organic medley mix. Um, those are what I get most. And then secondarily, I'd probably get the frozen um, cauliflower or frozen broccoli at uh, Costco, um, you know, organic. And then other than that, I'd go to Trader Joe's to get their frozen fruits. If, you don't, if you're not a member of Costco, I only like to get organic frozen fruits and vegetables generally. Now, the other thing I get at Costco are the frozen dragon fruits and frozen organic cherries. I think both those are actually organic. Um, I like to only get like berries and things that I cannot get fresh. And then of course at Trader Joe's, my favorite is the frozen organic wild blueberries, the Trader Joe's brand that are pesticide free. Next question is from uh, Maran Mamba7629. Hi John, is there a place to go and find links to items you recommend besides the individual videos? Right now, for example, I am looking to get rid of the battery option on my Tribass vacuum pump. I cannot even remember which channel I found it. Another one is the powder organic black raspberry bags for adding to blends. Again, which channel? Smoothies. All right, so the vacuum blender addition for the Tribass vacuum pump was on my discount juicers channel. And the powder organic black raspberry uh, powder was probably on this channel. Anyways, a place I've made it easy for all you guys to find all the products that I use on a regular basis and or have recommended in the past is my Amazon shop. Put a link down below. It's amazon.com slash John Cole. I try to kind of keep that list updated with all my recommendations for you guys so you guys could find them all easily in one place. All right, next question is from uh, Frank, Frank ZY. Hi, I really like this new thing you've doing. Got questions. You seem to have so much knowledge lately. I've been studying all I can get my hands on regarding fermentation but i'm still scared shitless i now understand the meaning of the nose nose i've dumped so much of my recent ferments because of smell my problem is i think my wa my water tap water is no go for fermentation thinking of getting a carbon distiller and even a hydrogen water maker what are your thoughts on hydrogen water and hydrogen inhalation all right so so as far as your ferments i would definitely recommend using some kind of purified water, whether you have a water distiller at home or reverse osmosis, those are good waters to use. And or you could buy bottled water that is, you know, free of chlorine. That being said, while our nose does know, I think people are probably far more too apt to throw out their ferment when it is actually perfectly good. I interviewed the fermentation expert Sandor Katz, links down below, where we discuss a ferment going bad. And most times I think people are just overly sensitive. I would say the other thing, if you guys can't source like fresh quality water to do your ferments, you know, in your fermenting vegetables, I would say use a juice as the base. So for example, you could juice cabbages, get the cabbage juice, use that as the base, and then use a virgin cabbage, chop it up as, you know, the sauerkraut. So you're then soaking whole cut up cabbage, sliced up or whatever, with the cabbage juice. And then you can actually do a ferment. And then more importantly, make sure you do the fermentation under vacuum. Very important tip. Once again, links down below to my Amazon shop where I have vacuum fermentation kits that I recommend. If you do vacuum and fermentation 
you know, there basically shouldn't be any issues with mold growth unless you have contamination, which hopefully you're using, you know, pretty much sterilized items, but you don't have to be too paranoid about sterilizing everything. And then uh, my thoughts on hydrogen water and hydrogen inhalation. So I believe that it's good. I have drank hydrogen water. It doesn't last very long, so I don't recommend you guys buy it. And a lot of the machines are actually made in China. I would not recommend a hydrogen water, water making machine from China and or using like hydrogen, you know, drops or tablets to make hydrogen water. I would recommend only machines made in South Korea or Japan. And then of course, breathing hydrogen inhalation. I think that can be good as well. I haven't, I've done it like maybe like five times. Um, I don't do it regularly. Um, but I think, you know, hey, while these things are great, let's not forget, you know, the goal isn't to like, you know, breathe hydrogen, but to have hydrogen in the foods we eat, you know, and by juicing fruits and vegetables, by eating fruits and vegetables, you know, you're going to get more hydrogen in you naturally. That being said, excess hydrogen water probably, you know, can't hurt you and can probably actually benefit you, but it's not like the magical cure in my opinion. So the next question is from Lilane. Uh, Punana Mania 6815, sorry if I butchered the name. What are the best raw recipe books slash foods for building up? I messed up and lost lots of weight when I was raw because I wasn't eating enough for all the physical labor I was doing. So naturally my body used to use my fat and muscle storage and now I'd like to build it back up. I prefer to stay raw or mostly raw. Alright, so what I'd recommend for raw recipe books for building is of course... Nate and Lissa, or Lissa specifically, at Raw Food Romance. So I think it's payhip.com slash raw food romance. Um, she often has 40% off coupon codes. Her food is the bomb. Of course, Melissa is and Nate are maintaining their weight. <laughs> um, so, you know, they're not losing weight on the foods they eat. They eat, you know, some fruit, yes, but also lots of vegetables. And they're processed in amazing ways. They recently came out with a taco book that I've yet to try their tacos, but I'm sure they're the bomb, but get their wrap book, get all the books Alyssa puts out. I can vouch that they are actually healthy recipes, satisfying, and you know, just make sure you make enough of them and eat them enough and you will be able to maintain or gain some weight. Other than that, I would also recommend, you know, adding some heat processed foods. I heat process my food, you know, eat a little bit of heat processed food along with your raw foods to supplement it, you know, so maybe eat a little bit less fruit or maybe you could, you know, instead of eating fruit, you could add some, you know, like steamed sweet potatoes or better yet purple sweet potatoes or purple potatoes that actually have a negative blood sugar impact versus rust potatoes, which I don't recommend. I think, you know, a steamed um, starchy vegetables and or adding some beans could only be a benefit to an otherwise raw diet because now you're getting more resistant starch and other kinds of fibers that feed our gut microbiome that may not necessarily be in only fruits and vegetables. The next question is from a Ninja Cat Savage uh, 3526. Hi John, thanks for all the reliable info and product reviews. I'm looking to buy one of those void vacuum lids you've been talking about. Do you know if they will fit my Vitamix Pro 750? Yes, so if you have a Vitamix Classic model before you have the Ascent or Venturas that have a built-in chip inside the unit, link down below to my video where I discuss this, the Void Kit will work. All right, next question is from Focus Queen 8925 Hi, John. You're such a gift to the world. Amazing how you share so much as you can. Thank you for that. Wondering what you recommend for preparing sweet potatoes if I don't have the same cooker as you have yet. Cooking or steaming? and as fast as possible or slow cooking or steaming. Also, do you need the resistant starch ingredients, chunky in crackers, etc., or can I blend them all fine? I make amazing breads at the moment. What are your thoughts on eating rolled oats, not cooked oatmeal? There's a lot of negative stuff about eating oats. Lastly, after more than 12 years of raw vegan, my body is asking for warm food. I'm getting extremely cold after eating raw foods and also very tired any advice also for prepping veggie broth how would you prepare that in case you wanted that as well what i did was all kinds of veggies in a glass ceramic pan and simmer at low temperature for a while video slowing show cooking potatoes with craig summers what do you think about that uh thanks and much love for you all right so let's cover that real quick so let's see here. 
Um, so if you don't have an instant pot, which I highly recommend you guys get, because it basically makes cooking beans, um, you know, lowers uh, lectin content, also cooks things fast, keeps more nutrients in general, um, I would recommend uh, steaming the sweet potatoes. That's what I do personally in the pressure cooker. I just steam them in the pressure cooker and it just uh, steams faster. I do not recommend baking them in the oven. You could use a technique I showed with Craig Summers. Um, technically, that is cooked in my personal opinion because it gets too hot. Otherwise, the starches would not convert and it would not get as good. And I personally prefer to steam instead of uh, you know, boil things or hook, cook things in water because things can leach out into the water. And also, of course, it would take longer. All right. And then uh, you could take basically once you cook the sweet potatoes, of course, you can blend them, chop them, mash them, and then dehydrate them into crackers or cook them into things. And what I will say based on the science is that, you know, there's different benefits to the resistant starch in different sizes. So, you know, if you just eat it whole and chew it up to some extent and don't fractionate everything, then it's going to be good to some extent, you know, and if you blend it up or vacuum blend it up into like a more of a liquid consistency and grind up the fibers more, that could be also good in different ways. So, you know, I'm not going to say one is necessarily better than the other. I'm going to say that probably doing both is best because now you're getting fibers in all the different sizes. So my opinion on eating, uh, Rolled oats, I believe they can be quite helpful, once again, to diversify your diet. I'll link down below to a video I recently made on my soaked um, and sprouted oatmeal uh, that's probiotic and prebiotic rich. And then also your other question is about any advice on getting tired after eating raw foods. So my, my thing to you is we, how much fruit are you eating, right? If you're overeating fruit for you and your body, right? Um, then you may be getting more of a blood sugar hit, which then is causing you to get tired. If you have a medical, you know, situation, then of course see a doctor because I'm not one. But I will say that that's what I felt personally when I would overeat the fruits. I would get more tired. And that's why I switched over to eating more vegetables, including even heat processed vegetables, because I believe they are more important and they don't have the blood sugar hit. You know, so I eat more heat processed vegetables and even heat processed beans so I could, you know, reduce the, sh the fruits content by a little bit and it's working better for me. Also, of course, based on my microbiome testing, my microbiome has increased due to the, you know, different style diet I've been eating than all raw, which I believe to be a good thing. And then any advice on... Uh, veggie broth. So I don't generally make veggie broth. I basically, what I do is I'll cook a whole bunch of vegetables in the Instant Pot. Link down below to a video where I show how I did this on my gardening channel when I was cooking things for my parents. I put water in the bottom, but what I did yesterday was I cooked vegetables like normal, and then all the nutrients out of the vegetables leached into that cooked water in the bottom, and then even added extra cooked water. So then once I was done, I basically took all that cooked water off and put it in a jar and vacuum sealed it, and actually made like uh, two quarts of what I would consider veggie broth that now I'm feeding to Oakley, my dog. <laughs> so other than that, I don't know how to make it because I, I don't really focus on making kind of veggie broth generally. Um, you know, I'd rather just personally eat the vegetables. And if I, use, I, if I need a broth for soup, I'm probably going to eat the soup raw. I'm not going to just make a heat processed soup. I'm going to juice like bell peppers or carrots to make a soup base. I'm going to blend that with some nuts and seeds and then actually use that in a big in a blender with you know um, some herbs and spices pour that into a big bowl and then chop up a lot of raw vegetables and maybe even put some cooked vegetables or cooked beans or cooked mushrooms into that soup but then that is not heated that is my preference i do not like veggie broths for me personally because basically they're just scant about a bit amount of nutrients from the leach water and minerals which is still good but i'd rather eat the whole vegetables especially when i'm consuming heat processed foods i'm not just doing this you know, willy-nilly in my personal opinion. All right, then if I think if you're simmering things at a low temperature, you know, I mean, I personally wouldn't do that because I don't have a stove. I would just use the Instant Pot. Everything could cook a little bit faster. I prefer to cook things, uh, you know, faster at a little bit higher temperature in general that will retain more nutrients unless you are doing like sous vide cooking under vacuum uh, to prevent the oxidation, then that might be good as well. All right, so the next question is from uh, Joyous m 3 km Hi, OK Raw, I love your channel. I'm starting my raw vegan journey. Any suggestions on what type of wall shelves would be good to put an Excalibur 5 tray dehydrator on? I don't have a lot of space in my kitchen 
worktop. I have a place where my cooker used to be. Any tips would be appreciated. Namaste. So if you are truly going all raw, then what you might want to do is what my friend did is you want to go ahead and unplug your oven, take out all the metal shelves in the oven, and your five tray dehydrators should fit inside your oven. And when you're ready to use the dehydrator, you can just open up your oven door, turn it on, and of course, you know, if you're running the dehydrator, leave the door cracked minimally, and you can use that as your dehydrator. That being said, make sure you <laughs> unplug your oven, because I also had a friend that did this, and their wife didn't know that they had the dehydrator in the oven, and they turned the preheat on <laughs> to preheat, and it melted the dehydrator. So that's not good. Otherwise, you know, for shelves, like my dehydrator sits on my, um, like kitchen countertop. Um, it's just a dedicated space. Actually, on the top of it, I use actually, I put a little pad and I store my ceramic knives up there. Um, other than that, like shelves, you need like a deep shelf. So that's the issue. A lot of shelves are narrow. So what I'd recommend is I'd recommend like some, what's called NSF commercial style restaurant shelving. So if you go to like to a Walmart or Home Depot, they have NSF shelving for kitchens. And those are kind of heavy duty. I got mine at Costco. They have wheels on it. So you could like move this whole cart around. That'll give you optimal space to basically stack fruits on different levels, on different trays, and also have a space for your dehydrator and all the other kitchen gadgets you'll need for eating a raw foods diet. So if that helps you out there. Next question is from Aaron Harrison. What kind of steamer, please? All right, so here's the thing. I currently am using uh, three different kinds of steamers, one primarily, and two I'm currently in the testing process. So my main steamer I use is the Instant Pot. That's the one I'd recommend to everybody. It's just super easy, super convenient. So on a recent trip, I brought a, a Chef Wave, which is the brand, and Chef E steamer, which is kind of like a new kind of steamer. You basically fill up a container with water, and then it sucks water into this unit and then basically turns it into super steam and then super steams, uh, you know, whatever you have inside. I've only used it on broccoli at this point. And it took like, I don't know, it took like 30 minutes to steam broccoli in that machine. It's kind of like a more of a light steaming because um, it doesn't like steam super hard. So that's kind of interesting. I kind of prefer the pressure cooking because it works a lot quicker in my opinion. And I also have another steamer that I have not experimented with yet called the Vitaclay, which is more of a traditional steamer. But the cool thing about the Vitaclay is that actually you're cooking in clay instead of stainless steel. And that's going to probably, you know, take some time because you got to heat the water from the bottom to steam it. Um, so yeah, the Instant Pot is probably what, what I'd recommend if you only had to buy one cooking appliance. <laughs> That's what I'd get. So the next question is from John Kenyuk. So do you leave home? What is the inventory that you carry? <laughs> yes, I often leave home. I love traveling. Traveling is one of my largest hobbies. And when I travel, what inventory or what things do I take? It really depends on how long I'm going for and how I'm traveling. So for example, if I'm traveling by car, you know, for like a week, a week for sure, I'm going to take at least minimally a vacuum blender, maybe a slow juicer. Those are the two main appliances that I take with me these days. I might take a steamer with me if I have extra room and I don't anticipate like bringing anything extra back on my trip. Um, those are probably pretty important to me because, you know, the, 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 they could all allow me to eat more vegetables, which is my goal these days, and even, you know, move beyond just raw foods, maybe incorporate a little bit of beans and, you know, uh, sweet potatoes that are purple or whatnot when I'm traveling. Of course, my staples are, of course fresh juices, and vacuum blended smoothies, depending on where I am. Of course, I also take kitchen knives and a cutting board. Um, and of course, you could buy raw foods anywhere. At the grocery store, you know, fruits and vegetables are available everywhere. My, although when I travel, my goal is to do, visit farms and farmer's markets and try to source most of my food from there, and then go to the health food store or buy organic produce to fill in after um, that. Um, other than that, if I'm going by a plane, like, I don't know, if I'm going by the plane for a weekend, I might not take anything. I might just take a vacuum blender. It depends if I'm checking bags. Like, if you're, if you're not checking bags, then you could take a slow juicer, right? But you can't take a blender with blades in it. I've gotten blades confiscated out of my blenders before. So I have a blender that doesn't have a blade in it these days that the TSA took. At least they didn't confiscate the whole blender, so that was nice. And sometimes if I'm going to like Europe and I don't have 220 appliances with me and I'm going for some period of time, I just go to a store and like buy an inexpensive 
you know, blender or juicer and then at the end of my trip sell it or actually bring it back to the States and then sell it. So I've also done that before to have the right equipment because, you know, having the right equipment really just makes it easier to be on my and, on, and comply with my diet, dietary demands and not like I would consider hinder my diet by just trying to eat raw without any tools. Like tools to me are a necessity. Next question is from Emily Berry, 9410. Would love to hear your thoughts on in your next Q&A on freeze-dried coconut water such as Wilderness Poets brand when you can't get fresh and want some. All right, Emily. So, I, I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of, like, freeze-dried coconut water. I, I, I highly doubt it's 100% freeze-dried coconut water. Usually it's, like, spray-dried or they use some other kind of drying process. And there's usually, like, a carrier, like, malto, maltodextrin or something. Not that that's necessarily bad. But I think that, you know, I, oh, so here's for me. For me personally, instead of getting freeze-dried coconut water and then rehydrating it with hopefully at least distilled or, you know, reverse osmosis water, which is pure, right, you're still, like, not getting the, you're getting the minerals of the coconut water, but you're not getting the structured water of the coconut water. That's the main issue I have. So if you want minerals and you want a mineral supplement, yeah, you know, dried coconut water, you know, freeze dried or dried, spray dried, whatever, for minerals is probably a good idea and definitely better than some other kind of electrolyte supplement. That being said, me personally, I'd rather get some, you know, coconut water that has been pasteurized. Yes, I say it, pasteurized like in a bottle, glass bottle, or even a Tetra Pak first. You know, so when I travel, sometimes instead of buying water in a plastic you know, bottle, I will actually opt to get coconut water in a Tetra Pak box, which doesn't have like the plastic because it has actually a foil liner. And so that way you still get kind of the structured water. Yes, it has been heated, but it still contains all the electrolytes. And that's what I'd recommend. And of course, if you're trying to do lower sugar, look for the organic coconut waters from the Philippines, because the Philippines, they generally use the more wild coconuts that are a bit more on the mature side. So the water is not as sweet, but if you want the sweet water, then you want to look towards a brand like Taste Nirvana, which actually uses like Nam Hom, Thai coconuts, like the cheapest, the, you know, the most sweetest kind. <laughs> you know, I, I kind of like it somewhere in between. I like the Indian coconut water is the best, actually. And they do have coconut waters that are considered more raw. I wouldn't go for the Harmless Harvest. Technically, those are heat processed these days. Um, but there's another brand. I forget the name, a brand name right now. I don't even think they're available anymore, so maybe I should even mention it. All right, so... <laughs> But of course, always try to get coconuts in the coconut husk themselves, which are compostable. All right, next question is from Scuba453. In my country, fresh berries are expensive slash imported. Can I buy online NutriCost organic blueberry powder? Would this be a good alternative? Also, I sometimes I order the dynamic health tart cherry concentrate. Is that any good? Thanks. All right, ber berries are very expensive and imported. So then... You know, I don't know where you live, but I would encourage you to eat local berries. There's a lot of local berries and other wild berry-like foods that may be able to be grown near you. I'm not sure what country you're in. But, you know, here's the thing. Like, I definitely recommend getting some berries in you. And if you are going to take the time to mail order berry powders, then I want you guys to, you know, basically get the best bang for your buck. Right. So what this means is I want you guys to order some of the top tier berry powders that are going to have a lot more nutrition than others. Right. So, for example, ordering wild blueberry powder, make sure it's wild. Right. Instead of ordering standard blueberry powder. Right. That way you just up your nutrition significantly. And yes, it, it does cost more, but it's like 10 times more nutrition for maybe like, you know, 1.5 times the price. OK, maybe two times the price. The next thing I will say is another one that is very, uh, you know, nutritious is the black raspberry powder. You know, so try to find some black raspberry powder. Of course, I'd also recommend, you know, black. I'd also recommend, of course, I'd also recommend blackberry powder and try to find these organic whenever you're able. Um, so, and I do like to do the powders. That being said, my preference is fresh. That being said, the berry powders are quite concentrated. So you could actually use more and actually spike up the nutrition in your food. So for example, late, like last month I was using like acai berry powder in my oatmeal. This month I'm using maki berry powder. The following month I'll use some other kind of like berry powder, you know, to spike it up and to get it more, uh, you know, flavonoid and antioxidant and micro feeding <laughs> micronutrients 
<laughs> prebiotic, prebiotics in my diet as well. And then you talk about uh, dynamic health, tart cherry concentrate, is that any good? So yes, I actually do take tart cherry concentrate. I have for quite a bit of time actually. Um, I believe it can be quite healthy. Um, you know, for a while I was buying organic frozen tart cherries at Costco and then they discontinued them. I think you could maybe buy those sometimes if you will still want to maintain your raw label. That being said, even if heat processed, I think the, start, the tart cherry concentrate is quite beneficial. I'd rather try to find like tart cherry freeze-dried powder <laughs> before I got the concentrate. But of course, good, better, best. If the concentrate is one way to get more anthocyanins and other beneficial compounds from the tart cherries that most people don't eat, I think it is a good thing personally. All right, we're down to the last question is from The Price Life 2374. What are your thoughts on fasting? Intermittent fasting for say 8, 12, 16 hour intervals has become popular. What is your opinion on intermittent fasting versus 24, 48, and 72 hour fasting or even up to 10 days? All right. So here's the thing. I think fasting should be done appropriately no matter what type of fasting that you're going to do. That's number one. Number two, I think that fasting is quite beneficial and we are all designed to fast. You know, 300 years ago, there would not be any grocery stores. We, when we're hungry, we just go to the grocery store, go to the fast food restaurant and get food. There'd be times when we were living in nature that we would not be able to find any food. We'd have to eat whatever we could find in nature or kill animals if we did that and eat them if we could find them or could catch them, right? So there'd be periods where we would just fast. So I think that regular fasting can be quite beneficial. Minimally, I think everybody should fast daily, whether you want to call it intermittent fasting or whether you just want to say, hey, when I'm up, I eat for maybe like 12 hours and then I you know, don't eat for 12 hours. Not eating for 16 hours, I think that's a stretch and the science is totally not clear. Like it's just kind of like, if, if, fasting is good to a point, but then you could over fast. And of course, also if you're restricting your feeding window so much, that's also restricting you to eating certain foods so you could really cram in a lot of calories in a, in a small amount of space in a, in a small amount of time. So generally, if you're doing like a 16-hour-a-day fast, you can't be eating like a vegetable-centric diet because vegetables have very little calories and they need to move through you and you don't have room to eat them all and get all your calories in a short window. So I tried to do that some of that during the pandemic. You know, I maybe tried to do like uh, eight hours. I tried to do... a I tried to do, you know, longer, uh, you know, fasting window was not successful. So I settled at like a 12 hour fast and 12 hours of eating during the day. You know, it'd probably be better if I get down to like eight to 10 hours of eating a day and then go a little bit longer with fasting every day. But I'm only human and I'm not there yet. Maybe when I'm in my perfect ideal world with a partner who is helping me out with life and doing a lot of things for me. I got to have the pleasure of doing that. But my life is so busy that I'm just kind of doing whatever I can and just like literally doing the best I can. So that's the intermittent fasting. I think it can be good for everybody. Everybody should take at least minimally a 12 hour break every single day to not eat. Very important. As to longer fasting, um, you know, 24, 48, 72 hour fasting, I think once again, that could also be beneficial, but be done in addition to and not in lieu of regular fasting. So, you know, some people may fast one day a week on their religious day, Saturday or Sunday, whatever that may be. I think that's that could be appropriate because I mean, once again, I try to look at model nature and in nature, we wouldn't always have food. Maybe, you know, a long time ago, we'd only have to fast one day a week. It's likely that we'd probably have to fast four of course, it also depends on where in the world you are living and what season it is in also. So I think that fasting one day a week could be appropriate. Now, if you're doing a longer fast, then that's when I would say you might want to get some medical supervision. You want to contact True North Health, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, um, you know, to do a supervised water fast. If you're going longer than a day or two, I would say, because then you can start mobilizing toxins. They could start coming out and all kinds of things could happen and you could put yourself in a dangerous situation. People have died from going to, you know, well-meaning raw foodists that also have fasted people that have, you know, not been so lucky because, you know, the well-meaning raw foodists that may believe in natural hygiene and other things that were probably great back in the day, 
you know, don't quite have the medical knowledge or experience to deal with every possible condition, nor do, nor do they monitor all your, you know, vital signs and do blood tests to make sure you are an appropriate candidate for fasting and doing it appropriately so that you do not hurt yourself or overfast. I think overfasting is a real thing and your body could basically kind of get into a negative deficit, even get in a worse position than fasting. And once again, you need to figure out the right amount for you. And I'm not the doctor to tell you guys, do this many days, talk to Dr. Goldhammer. He has fasted thousands of people and has the experience to know, you know, the appropriate amount of time to fast. And even if your, if your, if your health condition would be helped by fasting or not. All right, so that's it for this month's Q&A. If you guys enjoyed this month's Q&A, hey, please be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. More importantly, share this with other people you believe it could help. Also, click that link down below and post your question for next month's Q&A. If you have a burning question, you'd love to get answered on one of these Q&As. Also, be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you don't miss my new and upcoming episodes of Commander Fight Seven Days. You don't know where I show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel. Also, be sure to check my past episodes. The past episodes are wealth of knowledge. Over 700 episodes at this time on this channel dedicated to teach you guys all about how to eat more fruits and vegetables and how to be as healthy as possible. So with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRod.com. We'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best.